Welcome to Mastering the Art of Real Estate. I'm your host, Debbie DiMaggio, and today we are here with yet another New Yorker, Paul Zwieben. Paul Zwieben comes to us from Manhattan. Let's let Paul in. Hi, Hi Paul. How are you, Paul? I'm great. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. I just love this podcast because I just reach out to people. I've gone through people I know, and then I just start reaching out to people that I see on social media, which is so exciting that we have never spoken, but I I discovered you. We discovered each other on TikTok. I remember yeah. early on, I asked you if you wanted to be on the show, and then we kind of never talked about it. And then I think you must have seen maybe some marketing on it. And then you said, hey, I'm ready to do it. So here we yes. are. And definitely follow Paul on TikTok. I haven't gone off to your other uh, social media sites. I'm sure that you have them, but follow Paul on TikTok because he is very interesting. And I want to say sometimes in real estate, people don't, there are some people, believe it or not, who don't want to embrace social media. And mm -hmm. I believe, that, and I definitely haven't gotten a lot of business, I would say, off social media, but I think you have to be out there so at least people know about your listings, they get to know you, and maybe, be, well, they are getting to know you on social media, but I, when people are working it right, like you are, I think it is so cool, and so definitely check his uh, social media out, and then we'll go deeper into how it works for you, because I bet when I'm watching, I just laugh, and you remind me, well, we'll get into who you remind me of later, but let's introduce Paul officially. Buyers and sellers know that they are in good hands when working with Paul. Clients are his top priority. He is always focused, extremely responsive, and genuinely invested in each client's experience. He oversees every aspect of the transaction, ensuring that any bumps in the road are immediately managed. Finally, he brings the deal to a close for his clients successfully. It is rare to find someone committed to his career as Paul is to real estate. Simply put, Paul loves what he does. Before entering the real estate market, Paul worked in the restaurant business for 28 years. At age 14, working in a bakery and after attending college, he entered, he entered culinary school. In addition, he worked his way up to chef as notable restaurants like the River Cafe in Brooklyn Heights. In the mid 90s, Paul formed a restaurant partnership, owning and operating four upscale restaurants in New York City. BLT Prime in Gramercy, Calle Ocho in the Upper West Side, Rain East and Rain West, as well as BLT Steak in Washington, D.C. Wow, I'm impressed. When he's not selling real estate, Paul can be found sharing his love of food and real estate on his blog, Hungry Domain, hungrydomain.com. Paul writes extensively on two of his favorite topics, food and real estate. The rest of his time is spent with his true love, Carolyn, and their beautiful children, Olivia and Parker. So I'm at Paul. Oh, so thank you. I started. Um, so yes, we connected on TikTok. And I this morning as I was driving back, I had to run out to our country club and took a steam. I wanted to feel better. And somehow I did everything I needed to do before starting today. But as I was driving back, I was scrolling through your TikTok. I said, I want to really see what he's doing on TikTok. Um, I've, you know, I've seen it in passing, but never really scrolled all at once through all of them. And so what I find really interesting, so now I know from your TikTok and from the bio I just read about your days in cooking. So you had, I usually ask people, what did you do prior to real estate? So tell us a little bit about, or a lot, about your cooking and your experience and how you got into all those really famous restaurants and then how and why did you change after 20 year, 28 years to go into real estate? Sure. Uh, we can start in 1979. In 1979, um, I took home ec. I was in seventh grade, and I loved cooking. And I <clears throat> remember walking up to my four foot ten Eastern European Jewish grandmother and saying, "Grandma, I'm going to be a chef." And she was cooking something in our kitchen. She dropped the pans and the spoons, and she's like, "You should be a doctor or a lawyer." Oh, and, of course. <laughs> you know that that made me angry, and I was like, "I'm going to show you how good I am." And <clears throat> so. I got an apprenticeship as a, as a baker for three years. I would go to this is the bakery in the mornings and then I would go to school in the afternoons um, in junior high school and high school. I worked at a restaurant at night, five days a week, accumulated enough hours to be able to apply to the Culinary Institute of America. Went there for two years, then to, went to Florida International University 
um, worked at the Breakers Hotel for my internship, and then ended up at the River Cafe um, in the late 80s as a cook being paid $8.75 an hour. If I could have done it for free, I would have, because it was like going to Wharton Business School for to be a chef. Every person that I cooked next to became very, very big in the business. Um, and then I went to Chelsea Central, which was on 10th Avenue, 23rd Street, got two stars from the New York Times from Brian Miller. And then I realized if I was gonna make any kind of money, I had to join a partnership. So I joined this partnership and we really opened nine restaurants during my, you know, uh, what, you know, 10 or 12 year career with them. Um, and our final restaurant that we opened was BLT Steak in DC. I was fairly newly married. I was working at uh, the restaurant in DC six days a week, flying home on Sundays. And by seven o'clock at night, I would pass out because I was so tired. And then I'd fly back the following day. And <clears throat> so I checked out on one particular Sunday, checked back in on Monday, and it was the same woman behind the counter that checked me out the day before. And she was like, didn't you just check out yesterday? And I had this like aha moment. My wife had been a, a real estate agent for six years. Uh, I literally walked into the, the, um, the hotel room, called my wife and I said, I can't do this anymore. And <clears throat> we didn't have children yet. And she was like, you've been buying and selling real estate since you're in your twenties. You listen to every one of my deals. Why don't you be my business partner? And that's it. That was it. Wow. It just turned. And did you turn around and quit that fast or? Yeah. So the next day I went in um, and I was a lifer. I was a restaurant lifer. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had three business partners and I was like, guys, I'm I'm leaving. And they were like, they started to laugh. They're like, you're not leaving. Like, this is your life. And I said, you know, it's a young man and young woman sport. I have this opportunity to join my wife as a, you know, as a 50 50 partner. And I'm leaving. So I had about a year where I was doing both. And then I, you know, and then it was a clean cut. Wow. That's crazy. That is, that is like, that's cold Turkey. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and do you miss it? I miss aspects of it. I mean, I love, you know, there was a point of my career where I would basically work in the kitchen a couple days a week and then kiss babies out in the front of the house a couple days a week. And, right. you know, the art of schmoozing is a very big part in our business now. And, right. you know, I always thought like when I was in the dining room, it was my bar mitzvah. And, <laughs> you know, I was like the, the center of attention. And whenever I would talk to somebody, I would be focused on them and not on anyone else. And, you know, get as much information as possible on them, put them into my CRM. Oh, they had the salmon at Kayosho or whatever. And it was there and, you know, they were there in 1998, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, so, but, but I cook a lot at home, so I don't miss the cooking. I do miss some of the pressure, believe it or not, because it was <laughs> such a, a high in the kitchens because I worked in pretty intense kitchens throughout my career. Okay. Um, but I don't miss working, you know, 12, 14 hours a day standing on, you know, on my feet. Right. Right. Oh my God. So, well, you just kind of touched on my next question, but let's elaborate a little bit more. So what, what skills did you bring from that 28 year career? Obviously there's many into real estate. Um, anticipating my customers needs before they need, um, mm -hmm. not losing my temper, um, when it comes to certain things, because when you're in the service industry, look, the customer is always right, no matter what. And there are times when you know that customer is not right. And like, I'm a Jersey boy with a temper. And in my <laughs> head, I'm like, I want to rip this person's head off. But you can't do that in both real estate and in food. Absolutely. Any any other skills that you brought in from from that? Um, so as a chef, as, as a chef, you can never be late ever, ever, ever. So I'm never late. I'd rather be an hour early than a minute late. And I think that's a really, really important trait. And then I've tried, you know, in New York City, the people that are the most successful people in the restaurant business, for example, like Danny Meyer, one of the mm -hmm. reasons why Danny Myers is so successful, he doesn't have one enemy in the business, not one. And, wow. you know, we try to not have anybody that doesn't particularly care for us <laughs> in the real estate industry, because it's a very incestuous business, as you know. And, 
you know, relationships matter in deals. Absolutely. That's one of my, one of my favorite um, quotes is we're colleagues, not competitors. We all have to work together. It is incestuous. You know, if we're, if we're going to have a, if we're working on a deal and someone's on the other side, we want to work through it for the benefit of our clients. And if we have a bad relationship, it's not going to go very well, but it's so surprising to me that not, well, maybe newer agents, and I don't know, maybe some seasons agents don't understand that. But, you know, I remember someone saying, well, this person, this agent friended me on Facebook or LinkedIn, should I accept? And I was like, of course, we work together. Of course, it was such a, to me, such a a dumb question. Um, It was, we need each other. And so it's surprising that people would, would think that, I mean, I market, also to agents, I might have a listing they want. They might have something. I mean, it, it's, it's relationships and um, it's partnerships. So I just love to of highlight course. that for people who don't understand that. I can see from just knowing you from TikTok and speaking to you now and hearing your story, you're clearly passionate. You were passionate when you were doing your cooking. And I I mean, I've watched cooking shows behind the scene and I'm amazed. It, it's like military precision back there. Oh, yeah. and, it, and it so is. much yelling. <laughs> it's like, yes. There's a lot of a lot yelling. Of yelling. <laughs> it's, yes. it's crazy, but you clearly brought that passion into real estate. So now how long have you been in real estate? 18 years. 18. Wow. <laughs> 18 years. So you've, you've been doing that a long time. Um, yes. So did you have any, well, okay, let's talk about your team. So, and then we'll go on to mentors, but um, who's on your team and how do you work a team? If you have sure. a team. Sure. Like so we we do. We have a small team. Um, when we left Douglas Elliman, there were seven of us. And when we joined Compass about four months ago, we had left two people behind. So we have five people on the team. It's my mm-hmm. wife and I who are the principals. Um, I'm in the office a lot. She's out in the field a lot. Then we have our director of operations who's been with us for 16 years, which is a testament to us. Um, you know, she's a, literally a family member. We love her and she can, she really runs the ship, the ship well. And then we have two agents, one of which is about, has been with us for about a year. She comes from a family of developers and, you know, it's really interesting how, you know, her trajectory of growth in the last year has been like straight up, which is phenomenal. She just brought in a 57 unit rental building. Um, wow. in Brooklyn Heights, which is a big deal. Like, so proud of her. And then we have another woman um, who's been with us for about three, three and a half years. And I would say she's like a scrapper. Like she'll, she'll go after whatever, as long as it makes sense financially for everyone. Um, and, but it's, it's a very cohesive team where, you know, everyone likes each other. We all respect each other. Um, I can get a little chef like crazy from time to time, but you know, <laughs> when it gets real, when it gets really busy and I ask Heather, our director of operations to do something, she responds, yes, chef. She doesn't even question <laughs> it. So, I could totally see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, it, and so, you know, all the team members are required to bring in their own business, but okay. if we get specific leads that don't, make sense for me or for my wife, then we'll do it. Like, it'll be a side thing where I'll say to someone, you know, listen, I have this listing at 77 7th Avenue. Um, I think it's perfect for you. And we split it 50, 50. Okay. Yeah. I was always wondering how, and then, so you'll split it on something like that, but as being on your, so they're on your team and they're bringing in their own business. They, because they're on your team, do, is there a percentage that goes to your team or do they just, everything they bring in is theirs? No, um, no, no, how... no. So to base, well, it depends on each person. I mean, if they're brand right. new, you know, if they're brand, brand new, it's going to be 50, 50 for a period of time. So compass will take their cut. Then whatever's left, we would get 50% and they would get 50%. So, okay. you know, depending upon the split, it's obviously lower than 50%. And if they bring in their own business, then they get a bigger, a much bigger cut than we take. Okay. So you'll, they'll get a higher if they bring in their own. Of course. Absolutely. Yes. And I assume it's probably case by case sometimes. 
depending on yeah i mean some of them like when when natalie brought in this rental building she said can i renegotiate my split on this project i'm like 100 percent. Right. yeah because that was such a big project right. um no that's awesome because we're my husband and i've worked together for thir just close to 35 years in real estate wow. and our son just came on and um you know we hear about all these teams but we you know we're in a small we're in northern california in the east bay it's not a huge area it's not like manhattan um so we're always wondering how do people bring on teams and how do you get paid and and that sort right. of thing um but i like it i try to liken it when i explain to people it's 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 like you said when you were um cooking you would have done it for free when you were learning because you were learning yep. and so it shouldn't really be when you're a new agent it's if you're getting training and if you're you know if you're going to go just try to do it on your own without being on a team you're probably going to you know zero percent of zero is zero <laughs> I, I i hear you i hear you <laughs> Um, we're going to go to a quick commercial break and we'll be right back with Paul Zwiebin of Manhattan. Welcome back to Mastering the Art of Real Estate. I'm your host, Debbie DiMaggio. We are here with Paul. Paul is, so Paul, where are you located in New York? Do you, what's your territory or territory? So, so um, my wife, myself, my two children, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, we can talk about this um, another time. They live with <laughs> us. Um, nice. we, live on, we live on the Upper West Side um, in the 90s, right on Riverside Drive and have, I've lived in the same apartment for 28 years, which is very unheard of. Um, oh, and then we have a dog named Rudy, a golden retriever who lives with us as well. We do a tremendous amount of business on the Upper West Side, but we also, we basically cover all of Manhattan and we do a couple deals a year in Brooklyn. I would love to do more deals in Brooklyn because it's a hotter market than Manhattan. Okay. Um, and so, do, um, and how are you, how are you getting around when you're going to all your play? Are you taking cabs and Ubers and or how do you get around that city here i can drive everywhere in two minutes <laughs> so it depends on who, the team member okay. um so my wife refuses to take the trains ever so she <laughs> takes yellow cabs or ubers um i take i walk i take the bus i take the subway um one of my friends is like you should really take a city bike i'm like i'm not i'm never getting on a city bike in a suit oh, yeah. but <laughs> but the buses and the train the trains um, and walking are the best. Yeah. And obviously you've been there a long time, so it's comfortable to you. Is your wife yeah. also from New York? Yes. Yeah, she was born in Queens. Um, so she's a hundred percent New Yorker. My kids are hundred percent New Yorkers and I've been here for 36 years. I originally from New Jersey. Oh, okay. So tell us what, so I, I like talking about newer agents because we're, we've been doing it for 35 years, but we're always within our company hiring new agents to work in our company and um, possibly some to be working side by side with us. But so we get new agents and they said, how, how do I become successful? What do I do? So I say, I have what I say, give us three to five activities. They're a newer agent. They're your new team members. What do you tell them when they come to start? And they're, and they're, they're, you know, they're pretty, they're new. Let's say they're new. Um, the first thing I ask is if they speak another language and if they do, I tell them that they should do property videos on the listings that we have in their other language. So nice. like my wife speaks fluent Spanish and we have this argument all the time. I'm like, honey, just do one video a week in Spanish. Like, so she's Salvadoran. Salvadoran Spanish is extremely clean and like it's not like some other dialects where you're just like oh my god what are they saying um uh -huh. so that would be that would be one if they have children they need to drop their kids off at school every day they need to pick their kids up from school every day because when you're nice. outside waiting for your kids to get come out of class the people are going to ask you how the market is isn't that the truth <laughs> yes um we do you know again with the schools i do two dad's nights out per class every year. So I do four dad's nights out. As soon as they have one beer, they're talking about real estate. Um, I think being very active in your house of worship and or a charity are extremely important. 
because if you're on a charity, most of those board members are, you know, making pretty good money and they're going to eat. If they like you, they're going to give you business or referrals. Um, and then they got to have a social media presence. I don't care what anybody says. If you're not right. on like in our age group, yeah, I'm on Facebook. I've done, you know, I did a $9.75 million deal through Facebook once. Um, wow. I, I met Brad Inman from Inman News on, on uh, Twitter years ago. And he was like, if you're as good as, you know, being a chef, I want you, uh, you know, I want you to be my realtor. Um, it's, wow. it's, an incre- it's an incredible, incredible part of our, you know, lead generation. And Does your wife but, do the social media as much as you? I'm sorry? Does your wife also do social media or do you? No. No, although she posted something today um, <laughs> with, with us decorating a stoop um, with all these beautiful uh, heirloom pumpkins. And uh-huh. she had a Fleetwood Mac song on in the background. And I'm like, she's going to get more hits than I get in on any post. But I also do, you know, 14 a week and she does one every two weeks. So, right. but, but people like her stuff. So you so that Mike so I was jotting questions as I was driving today and so I wanted to know do you so you're you're super organized I would imagine with the social media so you have fourteen you do fourteen posts but I noticed they're not short I mean you're cooking you're creating something mm-hmm. you're, so mm-hmm. tell us about is it or is it that organized do you post what do you post is it um, I, every other post is going to be about food or tell us what your what it looks like and then are you which platforms are you on so it's it's very organic um like i met a broker an agent yesterday and she was saying yeah well i am on the compass plus team and i looked at her i'm like i have no idea what you're talking about i said let's do a video so we sat down we put the phone up on the stand and i said you know hey it's paul's weaving of compass you know this weaving team in new york city and i'm here with lisa and she's on the compass plus team and lisa I have no idea what that is and tell us. So there's a lot of things like that. Um, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's really whatever comes to my mind. Like when I used to cook, I'd walk into the refrigerator and I'd be like, okay, that works, that works. And that works in a dish just by looking at it. I, it, I could taste it in my, on my, in my brain without wow. tasting the food. It's the same thing with my videos. I just, sometimes it, you know, it, it's property videos. Sometimes it's, behind the scenes. Um, I did a video today with one of the big guys in the company and he said, okay, Paul, so it's now five weeks before the end of the year. What do you do as an agent? And I said, well, for me, I'm not mailing it in until January 1st. I got my foot on the metal because right now, if I'm not planting seeds now, my first quarter is going to be horrible. And if I get invited to three Christmas parties in one night, I'm going to go to every single one of them and we're going to entertain and we're going to have, you know, we're going to let people know about it. We're going to invite people. And it's just, you've got to be as active as possible in December planting seeds. Absolutely. Absolutely. It seems, well, the people who aren't as successful, they are laying back. They're not doing anything. And this is the time to keep going. I always find that I work harder when I'm, when I'm the least busy, I am actually working times is hard just trying to plant those seeds and and put it out there so i love yep, to hear that exactly pointed that out um so did have you had mentors in let's in real estate that over the last 28 years or when you started or do you still have yes. mentors that you- so i i mean i definitely even though i'm married to a latina and even though she's my business partner i look up to her and ask her for a lot of advice Um, you know, she's very level throughout the year. And obviously real estate is not a level business. There's ups, there's downs, you know, there's cruising and, you know, I could have a deal that goes bad and I'm like ready to, you know, cry (laughs) and feel sorry for myself. And she'll just look at me and go, just get up and keep going. So her mentorship is great. I've had multiple coaches over the years. Um, I had one coach that was very big with, um, you know, NHL hockey players where he coached okay. them and I worked with him for about eight years and I loved him. His name is Gary Parks. Um, I've worked with the Tom Ferry organization. Marie Gomer has been my coach for like four years and they're both very, very different, but they, they mentor me. 
And then I have, you know, different agents that from different firms that I can run ideas back, or I could say, Hey, what does your market feel like? Like, is it, are we on the same wavelength or, you know, is the press like, is it just me? Is it the press? Is it, you know, is it another company? So, um, so I would say all those different people. Yeah, no, that's great. So let's take one of the coaches and um, tell us what do those coaches, what are they telling you to do day to day? So my biggest enemy is me. And if I don't get my tuckus to the gym, literally six days a week, my business gets affected. I'm not as good of a father. I'm not as good of a, as a husband. Um, and it's like, it's like a magic potion. If I, if I go to the gym on a regular basis, my business is much better. And when deals go bad, I have a different emotional reaction to those deals going bad than if I'm sitting on my, you know, sitting in my right. leather chair and drinking beer. Absolutely. No, I really, uh, so, which leads me to my next question and this is perfect. You're just setting it right up. So what is your morning routine look like? Because every realtor that I've spoken to, um, everyone, we all have a good morning routine. I think only one person I interviewed, he's like, I'm not a morning person, but right. what is your morning routine and how early do you get up? And, um, so let's start there. So I get up around 4 AM. Um, and I, so I, and then I walk our golden retriever, Rudy in the park. Um, I go to Dunkin Donuts. I get two cups of coffee for one for me, one for my wife. And then typically when I come back, I'm like thinking about a video and I will say to my doorman, can you shoot it? And so it's like four 30 in the morning and oh he'll God. do a video. I'll sit on my stairs in the building and he'll be like, okay, let's go. Um, <laughs> like for example, and I, I haven't posted it yet, but when I was in the restaurant business, a lot of the waiters and waitresses were, you know, they wanted to be actors and some of them became really big, successful actors. So I've been doing a little bit of a series like Bridget Everett. She's um, a comedian is on like a, has a show on one of the cable channels. She's super successful. And I, I sent her a message on Instagram and I said, you know, is it okay if I basically talk about your success? She's like, oh my God, I would love that. And then, um, you know, so a bunch of different people I'm doing it that way. Um, at 5 a.m., six days a week, I am on a call. It's called the 5 a.m. call. And um, there's 2,400 entrepreneurs. Most of them are real estate agents. All of them are muted except for one person, and that one person speaks for five minutes. So this morning, I spoke. Um, and it was about, a, um, I was at a retreat for Compass in Charleston, South Carolina last week, and I met this young kid, and he shook my hand, looked at me in the eye, had a very strong presence, and I'm like, this guy was in the military, there's no question. And he said I, he used to be a Navy SEAL, and I don't know, do you know what Hell Week is when you try out for to be a Navy SEAL? Well, I do, but tell us. Okay, so Hell Week is something that I would never want to do, but basically yeah. they like tie your arms and legs, drop you into water, like 15 feet down, you have to untie everything, retie everything with your mouth while you're, you know, the, 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 the trainer or the, you know, the people that are not, or that are already Navy SEALs are like hitting you. Oh. And then after, after five and a half days of that, if you don't drown, you advance. So, um, basically I said to this kid, Aaron, I said, tell me how you got through hell week. And he told me the four steps and mm -hmm. I was like, I have to do a call on this because if wow. you really look at, and I sent it to you, um, I texted it to you. You can listen to it later. Um, oh, okay. That it's just like, you know, instead of saying, I'm going to go to the gym 300 times next year. What you have to do is say, I'm going to go to the gym six times this week. And next week when it's complete, I'm going to do another six times. And you're taking like little bites of the elephant instead of trying to eat the whole elephant at one shot. Absolutely. So, at, so th then I go to the gym at 5.30 to 6 p uh, 5 30 a.m. to 6 a.m. Monday through Friday. Um, then I come home and then wake the kids up, wake up my wife. They get ready for school. I take a shower, put on a suit, go get the car. And then I bring the kids to school. 
drop them off um, with hopes that someday they'll be like, daddy drove us to school every day. Right now, no. that's not the case. Um, <laughs> and then I'm usually in the office between 8 and 9 a.m., depending on their, you know, their schedules. And then and do then you pick them up? Sorry? We like to pick them up at the, uh, at the end of school? Yeah. I mean, we, it, it, my wife and I, you know, we, 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 sometimes she does, sometimes I do, but we both do it a lot. And then during the day, of course, you're going to have your deals that you're working on. Um, if you're not specifically working with a deal at that very second, what are other things that you're doing, activities you're doing to uh, promote, to push your business forward and plant those seeds? Um, definitely videos, definitely coffee meetings, definitely lunch meetings, definitely early happy hour meetings with, you know, past clients, current clients. Um, we did a, an event last week at a bar called Dorian's where we invited like 300 people and you, 300 people are not going to come to an event to watch like the New York Knicks, but you get a good handful of people. You have a couple beers. You're all home by 9 PM. Um, so those things are great. We're planning a huge um, Christmas photo shoot for all of my nice. son's classmates. So that's 52 kids and 104 parents and they're all nice. going to come to our house. We have Santa and Mrs. Claus. We cannot find an elf for some reason, but right now we have Santa, Mrs. Claus and photographers and, you know, I'll probably do the food and it'll be a great experience. So, That's you know, great. things like that. And then obviously yeah. talking to the agents on my team and also getting right. to know other agents in, in different parts of the country that I can do referral business. Absolutely. That's yes. Key. I love working on referrals and referring yeah. back and forth and it's, it's nice that you we have someone we can refer to because we want to make right. sure our client well taken care of. So, yep. you know, it's it's we really want to take we we do believe you myself believe in taking care of our client and giving them the best person. And it might be I have five agents in New York, but it might be that oh gosh, this person really loves to cook. You guys would be a perfect yep. match. Well, it's good. You know, you don't have to have just one person. I'm kind of speaking to the audience because you know this, but it's good to have a. A buffet so you can connect the right person with the the right agent and the right client yep. so we're going to take a quick commercial break we'll be right back with paul of new york city Welcome back to Mastering the Art of Real Estate. I'm your host, Debbie DiMaggio, and I'm having such fun talking with Paul and learning so much. And even though I've been in the business over 30 years, I'm constantly learning. I have so many notes I've taken and I just really, Paul, think you're amazing. I've only, Thank this is our first conversation and you do so much. And I love what you do with your kids uh, baseball team or the team bringing them in and taking a photo shoot. And not only yeah. is it fun for you and the kids and it's a memory your kids are gonna remember. We were very involved with our kids and their sports throughout. And that was just something that was super fun for us. Um, but yes, when you're, I always, when I'm training and coaching my agents, I, when you're doing what you love, it comes back and you don't have yep. to sit there and talk real estate. You're just doing what you love and what feels good and helping others. And, and then it just comes back. When I um, was just had kids, someone asked me to be on a charity and I said, Oh, sure. I could do that. I was home with my son and um, my daughter was in school. And I said, I can make calls. I can do that. I didn't really know what it was about. I just said, sure. And then as I got more involved in the charity, I loved it so much. And I continued to get involved in other charity work. And then I remember when I got my first 
listing and I was like, wow, I never expected that because obviously they had bought their house from someone else. So didn't never expected that they would come to me. And then I noticed that continued to happen. And I only learned about it. I only, it dawned on me years later. I, I was, I was doing what I love and it just came back that way. And that's what yep. you're mentioning. I mean, if you're your house of worship or you're doing charity work, I also say if that's charity work, isn't your thing. If you love cooking or you love golf, you know, whatever it is, do that. And you'll, ref you'll, be connected with those people when you're doing whatever it is authentically to you. Um, yes. so I was list I was looking at your um, TikTok. Just scrolled through a few this morning, and when we go to conferences as agents, I remember years ago. I was why would I go to a conference and you know with a bunch of realtors? What point would that be? Um, you know, I don't like to be locked in places for days and closed rooms you know we're active people we like to be outside we don't want to be um in a classroom situation but you said something on you just got back from your retreat with your company and and tell us number one why you go but i'll let you tell the story about when you go next time how you're going to even make it more efficient and beneficial sure so i um I, I love, again, I love to schmooze, but sometimes these big retreats can get overwhelming because, you know, you have like some of the, they don't have to be old timers. Like somebody walks up to you and gives you a business card and a little thing of hand sanitizer and says, we should do business. And then they run away and you're like, I'm never doing business with you because you don't know me and I don't know you. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So, but it, it, it just was very refreshing, but you know, the, the most, the, the things that were fanta fantastic about the event were the intimate breakfasts and lunches and dinners that I had with five or six or 12 people where you could really share stories, war stories mostly, um, and then talk about families and kids and, you know, what you did prior to selling real estate. And I think those are much more impactful than, you know, being at the big parties and, you know, having a bunch of beers with people because, then you're just like at a wedding or a bar mitzvah and it's like boom, boom, boom. But at these, these luncheons and breakfasts and dinners, it's just, it's more intimate. And I think there's more value to that. Absolutely. So yes, if you do go to your, go to any big conference, try ahead of time just to, for the audience to set up appointments before you get there. And then when you are there, if you hadn't set any appointments up, just make sure you find some people that you can connect with one-on-one -on -one and right. try to do a couple of those and some small lunches because it's so true when i was at mine last year or the year before in nashville we were sitting at a small table of a huge group of people right we're now at this small table and i'm from a very small town called piedmont california near berkeley and oakland and it's a teeny town well <laughs> We were talking and I, and it came to the, it came around that I, and she was from New York. I actually sold the, the her uh, nephew's home. So <laughs> it was such a small world. It wasn't, oh, yeah. you know, six degrees of separation, but, and then, you know, am I ever going to forget her? No. I mean, we had such a great right. conversation. Right. Um, and, uh, and it's just, it's so important to make those connections. And then also, so you, you know, we do meet a lot of people. So I'm going to ask you and one of the, how, you know, how are you remembering people that you meet? I was on a call with a, doing a podcast with someone out of Florida, I'm trying to think of the location. It was in, it was in Florida, but in my mind, I can picture, I'm so visual. He said they, and I don't, I'd never assume that anywhere in Florida seems to be their newer homes, but it was a, an area where it was uh, Mediterranean homes in an older established neighborhood in like the thirties. And I, and I, so I, I know that, and I met, I met him on a mastermind, and then we got to talking about how I just started running. I just turned 60, and I wanted to run a half marathon. I ended up running a marathon, and so he told me that him and his family run, and then we, he said, I said, I'm 100% Sicilian. He said he was Italian, and so now I won't forget him because you started right. to you know, make those connections. Is there, is there a way that, that you try to, because you're meeting a lot of people, um, how you try to remember people, or do you put them in a database? Do you put them in your phone? Like, how are you remembering these agents that you might want to refer later? Right. So 
I mean, just let's look at the re the retreat. The minute I met somebody, and then when I left, I looked them on. We have a, a part of our app where it says find an agent. I find mm -hmm. them and they're a compass agent. And then I put them into my CRM immediately. Where are they from? Um, when did I meet them? And then I set up a task to reach out to them in 45 days to talk to them about the market. Nice. So, um, but, but other ways of staying in touch, like before we got on this call, it was, I had like six minutes to just, I could have stared I could have watched TikTok, but instead <laughs> I took the link from my, um, presentation at 5 a.m. this morning and I texted it to like 40 people and that's wow. just another way of you know it doesn't cost a cent I'm not asking for business I'm sharing knowledge and hopefully a fun story and I'm in there you know on top of mind so I do things right. like that all the time oh I love it that's so great will you text that yeah. to me <laughs> I did I already did oh you did okay that's yeah, awesome yeah. I love it so that my next question is, and this is part of it, do you use any apps or programs to keep you organized and to keep you keep in touch? No, I mean, the CRM helps me stay organized. Um, okay. The cat, you know, my calendar, I, I, and I, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this before, but it's like, if it's not in your calendar, it's not real. And right. so like the calendar has everything in it, like everything. Um, but I don't use, I don't really use any apps. I use um, this one app and I can't even remember the name of it that helps me if I do short videos and I want to put them all together, it just puts them together for me. But other uh -huh. than that, I don't really use any apps. Okay. That's interesting. And when you're working your CRM, just tell us how you're using it. Um, I mean, there's, there's reminders of reaching out to certain people. There's reminders that <clears throat> I haven't reached out to somebody in 180 days or whatever. And sometimes I'll just go through randomly looking at different people's names. And, and if I, in case I miss them for some reason, I'll add a note and I'll just say, you know, how's it going or happy Thanksgiving or, Hey, did you get a new puppy? Like I try, I'm never, I've never believed in to being a pushy salesperson. I feel mm -hmm. like I remember one of the first open houses that my wife and I did, and I was watching her talk to a potential buyer and she was sort of leaning on the wall, very relaxed. And I was like, why did you hold yourself like that? And she's like, well, do you want me to be like this? Which obviously <laughs> no one does. She goes, that's how I hold myself. And it really resonated where, you know, of course somebody could be pushy, a pushy salesman, but I believe that the results are not that good when you are. Absolutely. I think it's, we're facilitators. We help. Right. We lead, we guide, we educate, we communicate. Yep. But yes, we're not selling for sure. Um, what? Well, give me share one of your favorite real estate stories. Um, or deals, or okay. You know. So I'm doing. So we're doing a deal right now. I have to be very careful. Um, so we're doing a deal right now where one of the people that live in the apartment is um, has mobility issues. And it's horrible. And, mm. you know, he flat out told me that he's got to get out of the house because there's eight steps that can get into the apartment. And I felt horrible for him, but um, it's, it's true. And at one point he started like negotiating with me. He's like, you know, there's a system that I can basically have bring me up the stairs and it's $3,000 of the building. And I said to him, I said, there is nothing that's $3,000 that's going to get you up into the building. And he was like, what do you mean? I'm like, they're just, you know, like I figured it would be $20,000. Um, <laughs> and it just, I mean, it finally worked out. We have a fully executed contract as of today, but it was not easy. Um, an exciting deal that I had once was I got a direct message on Facebook from a gentleman who I know who's a contractor. And he was like, I have a $10 million buyer. Do you want him? And I'm like, uh, yes. <laughs> and I, um, I met him immediately. He had sold his three car dealerships in Florida, made a lot of money. And literally four months later, we closed on a $9.75 million deal at 15 Central Park West. So wow. that's a fun story. Yeah. That is a really fun story. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So social media is good. You never know. I mean, we you plant seeds. 
we plant seeds everywhere, whether we're going to coffee, meeting new people, yep. you know, whatever it is. And, and these social media platforms are great. I mean, when we started there, there was no Craigslist. There was no email. There was <laughs> text messaging was new. Um, right. Do you do, um, Oh, I know. Well, because I watch, I saw your TikTok this morning. So the deal, congratulations that you just Thank went you. into Let's Grow On. Um, you had mentioned that it had been on the market on and off for quite a long time. What mm -hmm. do you think you did differently or your group do differently? And, or was it just, you know, luck and timing? But how did you sell that property? Um, I mean, so, so we had the listing. It, it was a co-exclusive with another agent um, from another firm. And we had the listing right before COVID at a much higher price and we had nothing like we had no offers and we knew it was overpriced and then it COVID happened. Um, and then it's, you know, that went away. Um, and then they had, he hired another agent and we, we started to monitor the sale and nothing happened. And on day 180, the sellers reached out to me and I said, your, your exclusive expired last night. They're like, how did you know? I'm like, that's our job. <laughs> and he's like, what do we need to do to sell it? I'm like, you got to drop the price by 300 grand easy. And they listened to us. And the minute we did that, we got tremendous uh -huh. amount of traffic. And, you know, we finally, you know, got the right buyer to, to, to buy it. That's awesome. Congrats. That yeah. is really, thank you. Thank that's you. Really good. Um, how is the market there now? I know. I, and was it slow? So we're, you're on the East coast. I'm on the West coast up up until the election, things got very slow um, in our area. Did you guys have a slowdown and how is your market now going into the holidays? So we definitely had a slowdown. I mean, you know, New York City is always like, oh my God, what happens if he wins? What happens if she wins? What happens if he wins? Right. And you know, so yes. the market gets really very quiet any election year prior to the, to the election. And then um, it, it's, it's definitely tepid right now. And it will be up to Thanksgiving, and then there'll be a little sprint right after Thanksgiving until a couple of days before Christmas, and then we're done for the for this year. So, right. but you know, overall, I would say, well, I mean, look, there's a fact: sixty percent of all mortgage holders in the United States have mortgages below four percent. That's right. the problem. Yeah. <clears throat> so, there's a very the fluidity in our market in the last two years has there hasn't been fluidity. Um, the people that are selling are having quadruplets, getting married, getting divorced, or getting a new job and have to relocate. Those or, or retiring. Those are the people that are selling. No one, not many other people are. So it's been a choppy market um, over the last two years. Brooklyn is hotter than New York. The, the rental market, the small apartments move very quickly. The big apartments, like we have an $18,000 uh, a month, three bed, uh, 3,000 square foot townhouse rental and we're getting very few hits on it. So the high end re rental market is quiet, um, yeah. but it's I would say it's choppy. It's just not fluid yet. Yeah, I agree. That's actually exactly how it is here right now. It's 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 yeah. very similar um, and bringing down the prices are that's what we have to do now. And like right. you said, the people who are selling, they've either retired or, you know, we had a, the, you know, the older the a passing in the family from the, the person who owned the property. So now the heirs are selling. It's just timing. Right. The, the reason we have listings, it's because it's timing in that person's life. It was not yep. planned, let's say. Um, so I'm hopeful that after January, things will pick up again. That I always say, you know, when we get towards the end of the year, you know, we are going to have Thanksgiving, then we're going to have Christmas, and then there's going to be pent up demand that people are going to have to get back to life and move on. Right. And I'm hopeful after in January. So you guys have weather. We don't really have, it is raining today, but we don't have, the weather is always pretty nice here. So in Cal right. in California. So do you, and I know in places like, let's say Michigan or Wisconsin, they, you know, they have markets where they bring everything on in the spring um, before winter and all that. Do you, it, is it, your market is so international. Do you guys have um, a good time? You tell a seller a list at this time of year, or is it just any time of year? No, I mean, the, we have two really good markets. The, the best market is the January through June market. You know, basically New Year's Eve happens, New Year's Day, people wake up and say, I need to get married, I need to get divorced, I need to have a baby, I need to move to Westchester, I need to move to Long Island, I need to move to California, I need a pied-a-terre in New York. 
that's when the market <laughs> starts going. Um, and it goes until about the end of June. There's still transactions in the summer, but it's not crazy. And then there's mm -hmm. the fall market, which is basically either right after Labor Day or right after the Jewish holidays, depending on when the Jewish holidays land. So those two periods are the best. That's so funny. So I agree. That is actually how our market is. And mm -hmm. when people are coming, you know, not who are coming to buy or they're, you know, thinking of selling, they always think, well, isn't it the best time to um to transact or to sell so a buyer can get in before this before school starts and i said right. no we are we are in an affluent market so i know in yep. new york a lot of people go to the hamptons and then upstate yep. and we're in an affluent area so you know once school's out they're going to their summer homes they're going up to lake tahoe they're going wherever they yep. go the kids are out of, out of school so summer actually yes there'll be some deals but it's not the hot time. The hot time right. is that January kind of for us now is January through um, even the early May because it um, school due to, due to COVID, I guess the school started getting out earlier and earlier and then going back right. to school earlier in August. So um, summer comes quite quickly end of May and June. And then there's a lot of graduations, whether it's preschool or college or high school, you know, people mm -hmm. are being diverted um, from those. So from right. those different activities. So let's, um, we have a little few more minutes before we wrap up bringing, let's bring on a listing. Tell us what you do. What is your plan when you guys bring on a listing and who's involved in that and who's so, all that? Um, I mean, if, if it's one of my listings with my wife, um, basically, typically we'll, we'll do a property video on the, on the property. We'll do you know beautiful photos and beautiful floor plan. Heather is uh, our uh, director of operations is an art history major. She'll do the copy for the for the listing, and then once it's all in a nice little package, we'll put it on as a private exclusive for like a week, basically, which is not accruing any days on market. And it's sort of like when Apple says they're coming out with a new iPhone. It's the same concept. So oh, it'll be a private exclusive. Then for like a day or two, we'll do coming soon. And then we make it live. When we make it live, we will then basically advertise on Facebook, Facebook business page, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, and those are the social media platforms. And then we'll do electronic mailings, um, you know, real print mailings, um, and then e-blast to, you know, the, all the other brokerages to tell them about the listing that we have. And then do you guys, we're big on open houses. Do you guys do a lot of open houses there? So prior to COVID, yes. And now post COVID, we do by appointment open houses, which makes it more efficient. I mean, I could do 10 open houses on a Sunday and basically push different people into different appointments. And it's just extremely efficient. When you're doing a 90 minute open house, yes, you don't have the opportunity to, to talk to a lot of direct buyers, but they're still going to come to a private open house. Um, but we just, we, it hasn't come back yet. I mean, I wish, I hope it does, but it hasn't yet. So tell me, how do you work a, a, a by appointment open house? Because the reason we have open houses is if, if the agents, you know, are lazy because their buyers are looking on the internet and right. they're going to go one or not. So we make sure that our houses are open in case that right. person just happens to walk through. And that's how a lot of houses are sold and, and they might have an agent or not. And then, you know, but they wouldn't have seen it because they're busy and they never made yep. an appointment with their agent. So right. how are you getting enough people to come through on these by appointment and who's calling you the agents or buyers? Um, I mean, it's, sometimes it's the, it's a, it's a buy, it's a buyer that has an agent and they're like, I just don't want to buy bother my agent. I'm like, this is their job. But, <laughs> um, you know, they, they just make appointments. So, I mean, look, I would love to have that extra traffic coming through, but it's just not happening in Manhattan that way right now. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So tell us how, let's talk on the buyer side. How do you prepare a buyer if, uh, for a successful sale or purchase and how are you educating them and walk us through that? So, you know, we, we meet them first. Um, we show them like a flipboard of, we send it to them the night before we meet, basically showing them 
what we what we um, you know what we'll do to, to represent them. We have them sign a buyer's broker agreement, which is an exclusive agreement, and then we set up a you know a search for them. They make comments, we make comments, and then I'm like, hey, do you want to see any things this coming Sunday? Or they might be like, I want to see these three things on Tuesday at three from three to four, and um, uh, you know, and then look, our relationships are solid with so many agents that I'm going to get more information from the agent than another agent would get because of, right. you know, the amount of business that we've done in the city over the years. And we, you know, it, it really depends on the person. There's financial people that want everything done in like little micro answers. Then there's the touchy feet, touchy feely people that want to, you know, have their hand held, but whatever the personality is, we have somebody on the team that can handle that personality or work with that personality. Um, and then, you know, we'll make an offer, make sure that the, all the financials make sense. And then we negotiate and hopefully we get it for their, you know, for our customer. That's awesome. Um, it's so different there with lawyers. We have yeah. escrow. And we don't have what you, all that you go through. It seems very complicated with the co-ops and everything. Um, so let's go back to your 25 year old self in real estate, not cooking, but what would you have told what would you tell yourself now where you are now? And if, when you were starting out in real estate, what could you share with that younger self or, or a newer agent um, who's getting into the business? Um, do not go in as a solo agent, work on, work on a good team um, and, you know, learn from them. If you have to commit to a year where you're making no money, but you can live without, um, you know, without making money, maybe your parents are supporting you. That's the way to go. You know, a lot of very successful agents worked for very successful agents <clears throat> and they learned, you know, everyone's different. Like, you know, I can, you know, point at five different teams in my office that are all successful and they all do things differently. But, you know, you want to work with a team where it's hand, where they're hands on and where they coddle you at the beginning and support you throughout the period. And you learn and you learn every day. Absolutely. No, I think it's so important. People get hooked up on, um, you know, but I want to do it on my own so I can earn all of the money, but you're not learning. You're sitting there kind of comatose waiting. Um, right. One last question. Are you involved in any networking, professional networking groups? I joined in the last year, BNI Business Networking International. I've never right. been in a formal networking environment before. <clears throat> I'm enjoying it because it's very purposeful and I refer a lot to these, um, my colleagues. Are you involved mm -hmm. in anything like that or have you been involved in the past? Um, the only thing that we are in, an, uh, as in a networking group is within Compass. We are um, part of a group. It's like families that work together and, you know, they're all over the country and we have like a monthly, you know, meeting on Zoom and we talk and we talk about our markets and for, you know, for potential uh, referrals. But I'm not in BNI. Um, I don't, not that they're, I don't, I, I mean, I like being, I am just not in one of the groups. Yeah. We have young kids. When I had young kids, I did not want to be in any formal thing because I wanted right. to be at rent as much as I could. Um, right. how did, okay, so I was trying to tag you on Instagram, but I couldn't find your Instagram. But then when I read your bio, I said, okay, so tell us your Instagram handle, your TikTok handle and anything else you want to share so we can get you some more followers. Okay, so well, LinkedIn is Paul Zwieven, YouTube is Paul Zwieven, Instagram is Hungry Domain. Hungry is the food part. Domain is like a, a France uh, or a French chateau. So there's an E at the end of Domain. So Hungry and Domain. Um, <clears throat> Facebook. I don't think I have any other. I don't think I can accept friends anymore because I have so many. Um, is it personal or a business? Is it's it a personal, personal, but but business. Business is the Zweben team, so the Zweben Z W E B E N team, um, and then TikTok I believe is Hungry Domain also, and what did I miss? Um, and then uh, uh, Instagram is Hungry Domain also. Okay, and are you still on Twitter? Because you said uh, that's yeah, twi where you Twitter's met. Twitter's Hungry Domain. Oh, that's Hungry Domain as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It You're is welcome. straight up an hour. It was so fun. I look forward to meeting you in person when I'm in New York Same in February. Here. 
And if you come out to California, Northern or Southern, look, look me up and um, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And thank, thank you, you for you all your, your insight. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Tune in each week for another episode of Mastering the Art of Real Estate with host Debbie DiMaggio. Here Fridays, noon Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network. Tune in to where real estate matters matter.